Okay, Twin Star Exorcist, right? Maybe you've seen the anime, maybe you've read the manga, maybe you've done both, or neither. Whatever it may be, if you haven't read the manga, give me exactly 45 seconds to sell you on why it's great. Twin Star Exorcist is a battle shonen that genre blends with romance. The titular twin stars Rokuro and Benio are tasked with getting married and eventually having a child who is prophesied to end an ongoing war with impurities known as Kagare. The story takes place over many years and follows their ever-changing relationship. Initially, they can't stand each other, but their blooming romance grows with each battle. They support each other through emotional trauma, eventually fall in love, and fight together as a unit. It all blends into such an enjoyable mix of cool fight scenes, awesome transformations, super cute romance, wholesome tenderness, and believable, well-paced relationship building. I really love this manga. I wanted to summarize its appeal for two reasons. For one, I'm about to spend half an hour tearing apart the adaptation to one of my favorites, and I want newcomers, as well as those who have only watched the anime, to know that they should still read the manga. Barely any of the anime is canon, and only a mere sixth of the manga's current story is adapted, so the only way you're going to get the full picture is by reading it. For two, I want you to know that none of what I said matters when it comes to the adaptation, so throw it out the window because if you don't, the anime surely will. If my description of the manga doesn't sound enticing, I get it. None of this is to say that it's for everyone, nor that it is perfect. Still, it's startling just how bad the anime is at capturing what made the manga special to me. The anime has a decent score on my anime list, and plenty of people seem to like it enough to give it at least a 7 out of 10. The manga also has decent reception, but there's also not as big of a gap as I would expect because, like many of its biggest fans, I loathe the anime. If I weren't making a thoughtful analysis, I would be yelling obscenities into my microphone, but my scathing critiques will have to suffice. I have seen my fair share of bad adaptations, I'm a berserk fan for heaven's sake, so I know the struggle. Yet few have annoyed me, made my skin crawl, or insulted what I value as much as this one. There are many reasons for why it has left such an awful aftertaste in my mouth, but if I had to pinpoint the main contributing factors for this being one of the worst adaptations I've ever seen, it would be the story is unapologetically vapid, the production value can be flat, the framing of battles is beyond lame, the characters are grossly misrepresented, and the romance of my favorite couple is gutted. Most of my issues with the anime, be it adaptive problems or wholly original, are rooted in one of those five points. The manga is not necessarily carried by its story. It's the type of narrative that serves as a vessel, but that's not a detriment, so long as it does its job in delivering great character moments, engaging conflicts, and natural pacing. That isn't to discredit what the story is capable of achieving within that purpose. There's an entertaining overarching story, one that takes its time in revealing all of its secrets without dragging out its ideas. Snappy pacing keeps things rolling, never allowing conflicts to get stuck in the mud while letting characters grow and change at a believable rate. It doesn't always make a push for the end, but it's far from aimless. Arcs are paced just right so that meaningful progression can be made and new ideas can be implemented before the well ever dries up. The first arc lasts all but five volumes, planting the seeds for character motivations, central conflicts, and romance. This is my least favorite part of the manga, but it does a surprising amount of legwork for the arcs that succeed it. Without any time wasted, it gives all the reasons to care about these two and their story moving forward. The second arc is when things get exciting, and I started to notice how much I loved Twin Star Exorcist. Everyone ages up by two years, a fan favorite character is added, the lore is deepened, there's a great climactic battle, and it makes a massive push for romance. I like the first arc, but I love the second because it took what had already been done, built on top of it, and reached for greater heights. When the anime was released, the manga was just about to wrap up the second arc. It had just the right amount of material to make a two-core season adapting both arcs. That's hella funny! <laughs> Unfortunately, the anime is 50 episodes, and it, for reasons beyond me, doesn't adapt the second arc. Everything that was worked up to in those two arcs is minimized to a half-baked retelling of what I think is supposed to be the first arc. Forget adapting the second arc, it couldn't even get that far before butchering the story to hell and back. 
Characters appear out of place, flavorless filler is rampant from the beginning, any world building is twisted in ways that make zero sense, and plot points are scrambled about. What should have been a clear-cut adaptation of a simple story turned into this mess. Nothing it adds or changes is meaningful, with only bits and parts of the original story getting to shine, with most of it being contorted. I don't mind deviation as long as it either adds to the ethos of the original or can be worthwhile on its own merits. This is neither. Just about every added scene is dreadful, falling into the kind of dim-witted, slice-of-life teasing romance that the manga was able to overstep within just a few volumes. Instead of focusing on a cool fight or a legitimately touching scene, I'm sitting here watching an entire episode about Rokuro and Binio trying to reach an air vent together. Sure, it builds on their relationship, however meager that may be, but wouldn't it be better for that to be done in any other way? How about that awesome fight coming up that strengthens their understanding of each other? Are we just going to put that on hold for an air vent? It seems so. The manga does have banter and silly antics as well, but it has a healthy balance and never overstays its welcome, typically only being placed in downtime between important story events and climactic fights. Well, at least some key moments of the first arc get shown, however diluted they may be. If the original story was good, then hopefully its core narrative can make up for bad filler, right? I wish that was the end of it, because then I might be able to accept this as an adaptation with a handful of bad episodes. After 20 episodes chock full of disappointing scenes, rearranged plot points, and tedious filler, it dives headfirst into what might be the worst anime original story I've ever seen. The next few dozen episodes feel empty, as if they're only throwing out random ideas for episodic storytelling. It results in a disjointed story that has no identity, purpose, or message. A good chunk of the remaining episodes become a road trip to stop something called Dragon Spots, which allow Kagari to pass into the real world. Typically, nothing of consequence happens for entire episodes until a 12 Guardians member shows up to help clean up the mess in the least impressive way. There's a child, Sai, added into the mix during all this, and frankly, I have never cared less about a character. She's supposed to be building a bond with her questionable foster parents, I mean, come on, they're 16, but I've seen Sims build more relatable relationships with their children than this. I almost wouldn't mind her addition if she wasn't so flavorless and, more importantly, didn't act as a piece of rubber between Rokuro and Binio's connection. Their relationship progress is at its slowest during this arc, while she's eating up all the screen time. Eventually, there's a big, dramatic moment with her character, and when seeing it for the first time, I felt nothing but annoyed that this throwaway plot had gotten more attention than any of my favorite moments from the manga. You know, the story I actually care about. After episode 30, it seemingly attempts to get things moving, but it's still plagued with episodic fights that have zero impact and lukewarm backstories for characters that don't have enough relevance in the anime to matter. It all comes across as a fruitless effort, nothing fun happens, no character growth takes place, and not a single conflict sparks even an ember of interest in me. To cap off a painfully mediocre story, the ending is abysmal. With all the powerful, interesting characters being taken out of the story, all that's left to confront the final battle are Rokuro's dorm mates, characters who I would struggle to tell you the names of. I kid you not, their inclusion starts and ends with them lining up to be taken out by random projectiles. Mere cubes. Not antagonist, not villainous Kagare, cubes. What an incredible way to set the scene. Why even have these irrelevant characters show up at all if their only purpose is to get knocked out by literal cubes? Even Myra, a prominent supporting character, falls to the almighty cube. Either way, after getting to the top, Rokuro and Binio finally seal the deal with a kiss before turning towards the main villain, Abe no Seme. The reveal of this guy being either of those is jaw-dropping, only in the sense that I'm drooling from how bored I am. How anyone could care about his antagonism is beyond me. He isn't threatening, he has no presence for 90% of the story, his personality is drier than dirt, and his motives have no dynamic with the main characters. His big plan is to spread a nectar of kindness and to make his vision of a utopia, but the conflict is solved by an obnoxious power-up and beyond grating dialogue, with more flavorless words being exchanged than I can keep track of. 
If he's so downer about humanity, so be it, but what does it have to do with Rokuro and Vinio's relationship, the ongoing war with Kagare, or any other characters? The last two episodes wrote an entire book's worth of how to make your climax sleep-inducing. I don't know how you can fumble the ball when you're already flailing on the ground, but Twin Star Exorcist somehow managed to do it. I'm not opposed to anime original stories in some instances. If an adaptation wants to take a different direction, that doesn't have to be the end of all hope, but that direction needs to be well planned and purposeful. The adaptation of Twin Star Exorcist is neither of those, as it derails into disinteresting subplots, spends too much time meandering, and rarely makes attempts to flesh out its cast. If an adaptation is going to abandon its source material, it better not phone in an uninspired slog of a story. If this is the best that it could do, why not just adapt what existed at the time, and if it was successful, adapt more later. Let's make this quick and simple to understand. Piero is an inconsistent studio. Some of their works have good production, and some are not so lucky. Even within a single series, some episodes might have incredible action sequences, and the next might have nightmarish character art. It all depends on staff, scheduling, management, and various other factors. I'm not going to pretend to know the specifics of what went wrong, but the point is, regardless of specifics, it is painstakingly clear that Twin Star Exorcist was never a priority because its production is consistently mediocre and at times embarrassing. In contrast to Yoshiaki Tsukeno's increasingly stunning artwork, the anime's character art is typically off-model and further into the episode count, things only get worse. On the occasion that the characters aren't malformed, I feel like a core memory is unlocked as I remember how much I do like Tsukino's designs. There were a few instances that I was almost happy simply because I saw Rokuro and Binio look like themselves, as if I was seeing them be animated for the first time and forgetting I've spent hours looking at alien creatures that only somewhat resemble them. It's admittedly hilarious that Tsukino seemingly changed aspects of his designs to mirror their anime counterparts, namely Rokuro's hair color and Binio's eye color, but those were never the problem. I surprisingly don't hate the character designs of the anime, they align pretty well with the manga's early chapters, so I can't rip on them too much. With more polish, these designs could have worked if they stayed on model. Regardless, it stands to be that my beloved characters only get uglier over the course of the anime's 50 episodes. Every ugly visual effect in the book of anime is pulled out for this series. Action lines in place of movement, bad transitions, and distracting filters, it's all here. Perhaps the simplest directorial choice but one that takes away from numerous scenes are these awful side parts during flashbacks. The changed aspect ratio is fine, I guess, but I hate these erratic lines that sometimes persist for minutes. This isn't the worst looking anime ever made, far from it, but every nasty part of mediocre production makes an appearance. Unlike Piero's big, successful TV hits like Naruto and Bleach, Twin Star Exorcist doesn't have that occasional fight scene with explosive animation or episodes with particularly strong directing. I couldn't point out more than a few instances where the animation was exciting or a single frame where the art direction wowed me. The second opening is the one and only time that animation I found to be worthwhile was showcased. I wish the entire series could look this good, but this is the exception, not the rule. While there's a handful of big story-driven fights that have at least decent animation, the vast majority has the bare minimum required to be an anime because it barely animates, and when it does, it usually isn't pretty. The fights somehow manage to make the flow of animation more stilted than manga panels, and there's a plethora of cheap visual effects and ugly filters. Worse yet, the art direction has no stylistic flavor or personality. At least in the case of a series like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, which also doesn't usually have top-notch animation, the sound design, art direction, and impact of each attack more than makes up for the somewhat stilted movement. Even if the story stringing these fights together was good, I don't know how excited I could be when this is the presentation we're working with. A well-animated adaptation of an action series is supposed to bring fight scenes to life, to give them that extra oomph that a manga never will be able to achieve. It's an action anime's job to give those moments zest, whether that is making the movement flow like water or giving a single punch believable impact. 
There's various valid approaches to take, ways to make action good, but Twin Star Exorcist doesn't do much to heighten the excitement of action. Beyond just animation, nothing in these battles stands out as impressive, and it all comes across as flat. The manga does fit into the typical dialogue-ridden battles that some battle shonen fall into, but it doesn't ever step on the brakes for too long. It helps that the character conflict is well-ridden, so battles can still be engaging during the intermedium of action, a benefit the anime certainly does not have. The downtime in the manga is more acceptable because it's both engaging as a dramatic story and surrounded by impressive artwork. When blood does start spilling, there's more than enough ink flying across the page to make the next 40 exciting. The power system is not the most dynamic, nor are the battles ridden with complex strategies, but the combat usually has fairly smooth flow and some stunning panels to communicate attacks. Nothing about exorcism or spell power is as intricate as some of my other favorites, but it provides plenty of lore to sink your teeth into, flashy moves that fill entire pages, a wide variety of abilities for characters to use, and awesome transformations. Especially in later arcs, I will probably never be blessed with a faithful adaptation. In contrast, the anime feels undercooked. It's blatantly obvious that this adaptation only uses the beginnings of a power system, and to its detriment, most of those awesome moves and transformations will never see the light of day. The power system is left to collect dust for dozens of episodes, with anything new only occurring towards the end. Even if it had to go in a different direction from the manga, I would prefer that over watching the exact same attacks endlessly. Maybe give Rokuro some fire-breathing powers or something? I don't know, man. What I'm trying to say is that Twin Star Exorcist isn't the best action manga, but it has enough going on within its battles to keep me interested, which is more than what I can say for the anime. Where in action, battles are limited by lackluster production, boring directing, and uninspired combat. Out of action, battles are limited by exceedingly weak writing and characters standing around giving sleep-inducing monologues for entire episodes. What this adaptation needed to do was capitalize on the ferocity of those panels, give the direction that needed zest, pick up the pace to a more reasonable speed, develop the power system a tad more, and to make attacks feel big and powerful. Its fault isn't merely poor animation, it's that nothing is done to make up the difference. However, it doesn't end at the story being ruined or the action sucking all the joy out of watching a battle shonen. We've yet to get to the worst part about this adaptation. The characters have been flanderized beyond recognition, or, in the best cases, they are mere shells of their manga selves. What baffles me is the inclusion of the Twelve Guardians. Not only do they have little impact on the story, the story does little to influence or change them. This is partly because, by 30 chapters into the manga, they collectively had not seen any page space beyond a few teases in Shimon's early edition. It cannot be expected for their anime stories to imitate the manga, because those stories simply didn't exist yet. But that begs the question, why even introduce characters that have yet to have their stories written, only to then not tell an original story with them either? These characters are just there as figures to fill a room. Even more prominent guardians, like Shimon, hardly leave a mark on the show. Which is especially egregious because his story could have at least been partly integrated into the anime, considering his large role during the second arc, even if that arc wasn't fully adapted. Yet, he does next to nothing. Each and every one of the Twelve Guardians is underutilized, but the mishandling of Shimon has no valid excuse. I understand that these characters had yet to receive much development in the manga, but this is a problem that the anime could have rectified by either adapting the story properly and in smaller chunks, or, if nothing else, giving them more original content that isn't fluffy filler. If there were any two characters I could save, it would obviously be the main characters, the most important pieces of the puzzle. Binio, who may or may not be my favorite female manga character, is more or less portrayed accurately for the material that was published at this time. 
Her personality is spot on for the first arc, and she gets a handful of nice moments that are adequately told, if a bit rough around the edges in presentation. I almost don't mind at least the beginnings of this interpretation, minus Kinako. As the first major departure from the manga, he is introduced in the first episode, but didn't appear in the manga until later. In fact, it wasn't until multiple chapters after this episode's release that Kinako became a canonical character. The problem being that his forced placement into the story's beginning undermines Benio's connection to Rokuro. In the manga, she is faced with two major emotional obstacles, and Rokuro is the only person who can help her. This isn't just a matter of fighting by her side either, she has no one else she can trust or rely on. She is, for the most part, entirely alone. Her growing feelings towards Rokuro are defined by her realizing that someone else is willing to shoulder the burden with her. Initially, Benio is a somewhat cold, emotionally despondent girl who is only able to open up through his help. Having Kinako with her from the get-go is tone-deaf because it doesn't strengthen her story or align with who she is. Not in the least. To my absolute shock, Tsukeno managed to implement Kinako in a way that made sense for both characters. Rather than being right at her side, he stays at her old family house, awaiting her return. It highlights his loyalty and just how alone Benio was until she met Rokuro. That's what good character writing looks like. In comparison, this interpretation of Kinako shows a lack of consideration for Benio's story. Still, to be completely fair, I don't mind how she is characterized. She looks, sounds, and feels like the Benio of early Twin Star Exorcist. But it kinda ends at that. Her story is limited after the first 20 episodes, as if Sai is more important than her parents' traumatic deaths or Yuto's betrayal. Sai doesn't actually do much to change her either. Benio's still the same character after her make-believe daughter turns into a magical tree branch. Great writing, everybody. If I haven't emphasized it enough already, it really stings to not at least have the second arc adapted because its ending serves as a great turning point for Benio. Instead, for the entirety of the anime's original story, it feels like she's trapped in who she was at the end of the first arc. She is Benio, but a version of herself that can't move past who she was. This is a stark contrast to her manga counterpart, where she faces emotional turmoil and harsh realities that forcibly change her. The anime's interpretation of Benio is okay, I guess I can concede that much, but that's short of being my favorite female character. Rokuro isn't much better, and in some ways, I think he's handled worse. In the manga, he is a somewhat standard, hot-headed, dumb shonen protagonist. That much is true. He doesn't stand out from the crowd by way of being crude or morally complex, but he is possibly the most endeared I've ever been to a character of his archetype. His willingness to work through every problem with Benio, his small gestures of kindness, his goofy lighthearted personality, those are the little things that make me love him as a character. He is not just a good shonen protagonist, he is a wonderful romance lead. That is an important distinction between him and the likes of Naruto or Tanjiro. He is full of kindness, just like them, but it is expressed through his strong relationship with Binio and their heartwarming romance. The anime does a rather poor job at capturing this side of his personality. Beyond a few moments adapted from the manga, Rokuro is stripped down to his most generic traits. He is still a hothead and dumb, but something is lacking. He's nowhere near as goofy, cute, or lovable, and instead he is just a loudmouth that's sometimes good at punching things. Because his relationship with Benio doesn't work as well, it hardly pulls out half of what makes me love him as a character. This ties into what I want to discuss about romance in a moment, but for now, I'll just leave it at this. Rokuro isn't himself if you don't allow him to have his sweet side. This sounds bad enough, but it only gets worse. To contextualize what I'm about to say, let's talk about who Rokuro is. Growing up as an exorcist, he dreams of eliminating all Kagare to save others, but before he can so much as start walking that path, he experiences a traumatic event. He loses all of his friends and blames himself for their deaths, walking away from the path he dreamt of. After this tragedy, he has no aspirations, nothing that sticks as much as that selfless dream he once had. 
That's until he meets Benio, an exorcist girl who he can't stand. They're paired up as a fated couple and neither approve of it, but as they begin to battle together, something happens. They start to find strength in one another. The two exorcists overcome challenges hand in hand, slowly falling in love along the way. They fight together and always support each other in and out of battle. Rokuro is there to help Benio face her demons and she is there to help him with his. He finds his way back to that path, the dream of protecting those he loves, and in turn, she walks down that path with him. The story forces them to be together initially, but once they grow attached, it does everything it can to tear them apart. Yet, because of their unconditional love, they always find their way back to each other and never leave the other behind, at least not in an emotional sense. Even during the second arc's bittersweet conclusion, when the two are forced to temporarily separate, Rokuro reassures Benio that, even if they are apart, he isn't leaving her behind. He's always waiting for her to be by his side. It's one of my favorite moments in Twin Star Exorcist, and it's when I fell in love with his character. And it looks like I'm not the only one, yet the anime just had to step all over that. There's one moment in episode 44 that goes against everything I love about Rokuro, a moment so awful that it offends me as a fan of the series and character. You can simplify the characters I love, you can give me the worst fight scenes in anime, you can bog this story down with boring filler, I won't like it, but I will bite as many bullets as you want. What I won't bite is Rokuro telling Binio to stay out of his way and that she would only hold him back. This is insulting to my very reason for why I got invested in their relationship. Regardless of his reasoning, even if he is only trying to protect her, Rokuro would never in a million years say something so hurtful to Benio. He is supposed to be a good partner who wants the best for his loved one, sure, but he never thinks of her as being weaker or less worthy to fight than himself. Even if she were stripped of all of her powers, he would still have faith in her strength. That's the character Rokuro is. To call her helpless? To tell her she would only get herself killed? The real Rokuro would never! His answer would be to train together. His answer would be to strengthen himself so that he can help Benio in the fight. His answer would be to believe in her strength. His answer would be to protect her on the battlefield, not to leave her in the dust of his own selfish actions. This is a fight with Yuto, her brother! She has every right to join Rokuro in battle, but this fraud of a character is too concerned with her lack of strength. Instead of helping her, he spits on their conjoined strength, trust, and love. It's the story and antagonists that are supposed to challenge their resolve in being together, not Rokuro himself. They are the twin stars, they battle together, but in this moment, all of that falls apart. This is not Rokuro, this is a betrayal of everything his character stands for. I should mention, there's a similar scene at the end of Volume 3, so similar that it's about the same in setup. Rokuro is about to train in preparation for his fight with Yuto, and when Benio asks to join, he tries to say no. I'm almost certain that this is the scene that inspired the one from the anime, but there are a few noticeable distinctions that make all the difference. For one, this was at the beginning of the manga, and this fight is the one that solidifies them as the twin stars, rather than a fight at the tail end of the entire story. For two, Rokuro is nowhere near as mean about it and he ends up saying yes anyways. During their training, he realizes how strong they are as a team and begins to see a light, a possibility that they can win their battles as long as they are together. These scenes are two sides of the same coin, with two separate outcomes that say a lot about their respective series. This all ties into the anime's portrayal of romance as well, which is, to no one's surprise, completely neutered. The manga is one of the few series that has managed to engage me with its romance and use that to create gripping battles and thrilling storylines. As I've mentioned before, I'm generally not the biggest fan of romance manga because I don't like sitting through the awkward crush phase. Twin Star Exorcist skips most of that nonsense, and what is there is more like the start of a relationship rather than the two characters struggling to socially function. 
They build a connection through battle and unconditional love through emotional hardships, all while being exceptionally cute during the downtime. Unfortunately, almost none of that transfers over because the anime spends the entire story sitting on its thumb, too timid to ever push for a relationship. While I'm invested in where their relationship is heading within a handful of volumes of the manga, I'm watching episode 37 and the story is concerned about if Rokuro is going to accept a love confession from another nameless girl instead of going out with Binio. What riveting relationship building, guys, am I right? Romance can take different forms. It can be slower, it can be faster. If this is the kind of romance that the anime wants to show, then so be it. But I like my romance to not waste time. Those who watch the anime and never feel even a tinge of annoyance with how dragged out their relationship is must have significantly more patience than myself or do not care about it to begin with. The first dozen or so episodes at least have the decency of laying down a foundation for their relationship, but somehow it feels as if they're less romantically close during the second half than the first. I even talked at great lengths in a previous video about why I love that Twin Star Exorcist romance isn't like other battle shonen, as it explores their relationship throughout rather than bookending the series with a confession and kiss. Well, the anime is a prime example of why I feel so strongly about the manga's strength as a romance. They have little awkward flirtatious moments and plenty of blushes to go around, but their relationship doesn't start making any movement until the second to last episode. I swear, I could poke their romance with a stick and it wouldn't move an inch. Just as Rokuro and Binio are stuck in this endless purgatory of non-existent character growth, their romance is as static as it comes. Any moment with half a heartbeat is adapted from the manga, and even when they do kiss at the end, it's more like an obligation than a genuine moment. They're in the middle of fighting about Mr. Fraud being the worst guy ever, and then he makes a move on her? Wow, I'm so glad the incredibly heartwarming and emotionally touching scene of Rokuro returning her lost hairpins, Binio crying out of sheer happiness, her promise to catch up with him, her telling her parents she found the person she could fall in love with, and topping it off with them kissing for the first time, could be forgotten in place of this. What an amazing creative decision that was. I'm sure it paid off. <sighs> I'm not saying I don't like Rokuro, Binio, or their relationship at all. The anime has some faint essence of why I love them, but it sells them short, undercutting what made them my favorite romantic pair. If this story had only been adapted the way I've continuously suggested, then maybe it wouldn't take 49 episodes for anything to happen. Maybe by now, it could have seasons where they're actually a couple and have grown closer romantically. Maybe they'd be better off than whatever this is. Instead, we're stuck in a reality where their relationship peaked with a drawn-out kiss and their romance will never progress into marriage, unconditional love, or potentially having a child of their own. Anyone who only watches the anime will never be able to see the full picture, not even half of it. And that's a shame because what made Twin Star Exorcist special was its ability to combine the best of two worlds, action and romance. What made the manga shine only glimmers in the anime. All I can say at this point is I hope you read the manga, whether you've seen the anime or not, and do not use the adaptation as a benchmark for what to expect. The reason I call it the worst possible adaptation is because it may very well convince hundreds of thousands of potential fans that this is what Twin Star Exorcist is all about. I don't want that to be the case, thus my reason for making these videos about it and reviewing each new chapter on my second channel. The manga has a wonderfully built out cast of characters, an ambitious story full of ups and downs, artwork that challenges the best of its kind, transformations that look cooler than just about any other shonens, and the most endearing, heartfelt romance between two immensely lovable characters. This adaptation is truly empty, void of what I love about the manga. I don't think anyone could see this and understand why I think so highly of Twin Star Exorcist. I wish the anime could be half of that. I wish I could say this is a good adaptation, but most of all, I wish I could feel any semblance of love for it. But I just can't.